Tonight we will continue talking about contradictions and uh, difficulties. And uh, I think what we're going to do is we're just going to keep teetering back and forth between the should I trust the Gospels and the contradictions and difficulties. That way it doesn't get real kind of stagnant. And uh, So um, two weeks ago I ended with the idea of uh, or I, it wasn't really something I ended with. We talked at, at great length about how there were um, different different um, event, different different authors said the same thing, but in a different way, and how that didn't make it um, less true. And I just wanted to kind of show an example of that as we start. Um, so Matthew twenty one twelve to thirteen says this. And Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all those who were selling and buying on the temple grounds. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, notice that, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Okay, now let's look at what Mark 11 says. The same story, but look how he says it. Mark 11:15 says, Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple area and began to drive out those who were selling and buying on the temple grounds. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple grounds. Now listen to this. And he began to teach, them, and, teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made a den of robbers. So in one, he says it as a statement. And the other one, he says it as a question, isn't it? Same event, well, which one's right? Only one can be right. That's not, like I was talking about two weeks ago, that's not really a contradiction. That He said the same thing, it's just how you how you word it. Nothing has been lost, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. There's, there, there's most of the examples that I found of contradictions in the Gospels have to do with some variation of that, where the different author just said that, worded it slightly different and so everybody's all ah it's a contradiction it's not a contradiction well he couldn't have asked a question and stated a statement at the same time you're absolutely true however once again that's more of just how you how you're how you're wording it it's not you know what i mean it's, it's not like that and like i already said a couple weeks ago too they weren't concerned with exact quotes they were con concerned with preserving the meaning of what was being said now can you look at either of those and say jesus said something that he did not say in one that he you know, versus the other one. No, he both said the same thing, that, that it's a house of prayer, regardless of how it was articulated. One of my, one of my uh, English professors actually used that as a point. Mm -hmm. Somebody can say something and then reiterate themselves in one little question. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I said no. I said no. Like, it's just kind of a being able to back up your point. Mm -hmm. With the question, I was like, that makes no sense, but now I kind of see where she's getting oh. that idea from. Okay, so we're going to go through a different, a couple different things. We're going to go through Matthew 5 and 6, and there's nothing in 7 that really causes any difficulties, so we'll be in Matthew 8 next next week. So Matthew 5.14 says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So the question being, wait, who is the light of the world? Because John chapter 9, verse 5 says that Jesus is the light of the world, and here it says that we are. Well, um, it's actually both of us. God, Jesus is the light of the world, and then we are his disciples. And so we are a lesser light, but we reflect him to the world, so we are also the light of the world. It's not something where it's a contradiction. Um, let's see. Just wanted to make sure that's all I wanted to say about that. Yeah, that is all I wanted to say about that. Okay, the next uh, supposed contradiction or difficulty is in verse 17 through 18. Do not presume that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And the, and the question being, did he destroy the law or no? Because, you know, we're no longer under the law, and it tells us about how, you know, uh, all throughout the New Testament, like this is a resounding thing about how we're no longer bound to the law. So the question being, well, are we? did he destroy it or didn't he? And here's the thing. There's a couple different things that, that are being said. First off, Jesus lived under Jewish law while he was here. In his earthly life, he lived as a Jew. So he lived under the law. 
He did this to fulfill the law. He had to live according to the law to fulfill the law. So did he come and just do away with it? Did he, did he come and when he was on earth, did he, did he throw away the law? No. He came, he lived under the law, he fulfilled the law, so that when, then when the law was fulfilled, he was called... Um, I don't want to use that argument, but Hebrews talks about the way that a new law was instituted because he was able to fulfill the old one. So um, he did not he did not come to destroy it. He did come to fulfill it. And having fulfilled it, we are no longer under the, the, the burden of the law. When Jesus fulfilled the law, he set us free from it and started us on the new law, which is the law of Christ, which is what Hebrews talks about. Now... Um, so the law was done away with. We don't have to follow the rituals and all that stuff. We don't have to sacrifice animals and all that. Um, so that was done away with. But the morals, but but the morals of the law were not done away with. It is still immoral for us to worship other gods. Okay, but not everything in the law was moral. The law just had a way of showing us moral, morals. Um, so another thing he kind of. Another thing he kind of did away with was the traditions of the elders. So the Pharisees had, had kind of come up with so many of their own laws to add on to the law, to make sure that the, that the laws of Moses weren't broken. They almost added as many laws as Moses actually originally had. There were 613 laws of Moses. Um, I forget how many laws of the Pharisees there were. There was like – I I'm, don't take this with a grain of salt because I don't remember exactly, but there was like five or 600 laws of the elders. The, the traditions of the elders. They almost had as many uh, uh, rules themselves as we had in the, in the Old Testament law for Moses. I mean, that's that's pretty intense. So when Jesus came, he kind of clarified things, pointed people in the right direction, and even though he fulfilled the law, but we're not under the law, we can still learn from the law because the law revealed morality to us, as Paul talks about in Romans. So we can still learn from it, we can still grow from it, but we're not, we're not bound to it. Um... We don't have to do the rituals. We don't have to do the sacrifices. The law helped us learn morals, and Paul talks about this in Romans. But it had very limited value. One thing that was limited about the law was it was nationalistic. It was about Israel as a nation. It was also exclusive. It was for the Jews. Well, the gospel is global, not nationalist, and it's inclusive, not exclusive. It's not just for the Jews. It's for all people. Um, so morals were definitely in the law, and Christians are still under morals, but they are free from the law itself. If the law is done away with, it no longer needs to be followed. Jesus fulfilled it, so it no longer needs to be followed. It, it the the law did nothing but remind people that they weren't good enough. <laughs> so when Jesus fulfilled it, we, we need to look to Christ, not the law. Now. That brings us to another issue that I wanted to talk about now. Some people teach that there is actually a, literally a law of Christ right now, that when Jesus came, he was making a new law like the old law. Like So whenever he says, you have heard it said so-and-so, but I say so-and-so, he was literally giving a new law like the books of Moses. There's like a book, the books of Jesus. And some people, some churches uh, follow this like as though it's, it's an actual teaching, the law of Christ, and you have to know all these do's and don'ts just like with Moses. Um, and they actually call it the law of Christ too. So I want to kind of clarify. All that they're saying is that we have a new set of laws, and that's not really what's going on at all. When Jesus said, "You have heard it say, but I say," um, let me let me wait to say that because I want to say that at a later point. So the first thing why we know that Jesus didn't give us a new law. When he, when he was here. First off, Jesus lived under the law and then fulfilled its intent, purpose, and practice with his death. He didn't, have to, he, he didn't come to establish a new law when he was here. He came, submitted himself under the law, followed the law, and then, having fulfilled the law, he set us free from the law. That wouldn't have made sense if when he came, he was establishing a new law. He couldn't have possibly been... A, a, been giving us a new set of rules to, to follow if he was under the law, because he couldn't have done both. He couldn't have been making a new law at the same time that he was under the law. He had to live under Judaism, under the Jewish law, before he could fulfill the law and before he could free us from the law. See, if Jesus came to give us a new set of, of rules of do's and don'ts, these are the new law of Moses or some nonsense. Well, 
you get what I'm saying, and I don't want to waste too much time. Another thing I wanted to bring up here, because I think this is a good time to talk about it, is that creation and, and the Genesis account, you know, when God created the heavens and the earth, that foreshadowed Christ's coming. So it did this in a, in a couple ways. First off, in Genesis, we see God giving birth to the physical world. You know, he created the world. Well, in, when Jesus came, he gave birth to our rebirth. To our, our So, okay, like a like a second birth on the, in the creation story on the seventh day of creation was a day for god to rest well in jesus um coming he was uh on the seventh day he was in the grave which was a call which he called the sign of jonah and he was you could say resting from the work that he did on his earthly ministry on the seventh day because he was in the grave and then he was resurrected on the first day of the week which is sunday which is why we celebrate um it on this um, Sunday. So that takes us to the next thing, 529. Now, if your right eye is causing you to sin, tear it out and throw it away from you. Now, you guys know that that's not literal, right? Jesus is not literally expecting people to be tearing out their mm -hmm. eyeballs. Okay, all right. Tear it out and throw it away from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into Hell. And the question being, is hell grave, the grave, or is it conscious torment? Is hell an ongoing reality, or is it something that just simply means you died? Well, see, a lot of this comes down to a bit of a confusion. In the Old Testament, they didn't have um, hell in the same... The New Testament was in Greek, and the Old Testament was in Hebrew. Hebrew has a different word. The Hebrew word is sheol. Um, and some of your translations might even have this. So sheol ha has a wide range of possible meanings which could be translated in your Bible as Sheol. Sometimes they just keep it like that. Um, or it can be the grave. And this is obvious. Uh, sometimes that's an that's the obvious meaning because it talks about the way that the bones are there. And we know that the bones aren't in like hell or heaven or any kind of afterlife whatsoever. So it's just talking about literally a physical grave. Um, and it can also be a word that they use for death more broadly. Um, there's that. But... but a more literal translation might better be the unseen world. Now, this is obvious. There's an obvious meaning here being the grave, being the unseen world, because once somebody's buried, they're not seen. So it would be the unseen world. But then uh, it's also kind of hints towards the spirit world as a place of the unseen. Um, and, and this is important because context is key. Sometimes people go, especially with cults, and they say this word always has to be translated one way, and that's just not true. Um, Jesus does talk about hell as a conscious place of torment, and uh, he talks about it repeatedly, so I'm not really going to say too much about that, but I am going to look at Luke 16, 23. It is one of the examples that he talks about, and he says this. And then I'm going to take another example from the Old Testament where Sheol is translated as, uh, it obviously ha has a meaning beyond just the grave. So 16.23, now remember, the word Sheol does not appear in the New Testament, so just to get that clear. Um, 16.23, and in Hades he raised his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away in Lazarus in his arms. Clearly talking about a literal place where, he, this, where this person, Lazarus, is, is conscious of what's going on and where he is in suffering. So, I mean, I could look at other examples where Jesus clearly talked about hell as a place of, of, of torment. I really don't feel like it's necessary. I feel like... You know, we could probably just rest there. What's the point of showing you 15 examples if one example is sufficient? So then in Isaiah, um, verse uh, chapter 14, verse 9. Sorry, these pages here. I've never read Isaiah in this Bible, so it, the pages are kind of sticking together. Okay, all right, I get it. Jeez. Okay, 14, uh, 20, or 14, 9 says... Sheol below is excited about you to meet you when you come. It stirs the spirits of the dead for you. It's clearly not talking about the grave. There is no spirit in the grave. This is something that's established in other places. It stirs the spirit of the, of the dead for you, all the leaders of the earth. It raises all the kings of the nations from the thrones. So clearly it's talking about more than the grave there. And we're talking about the Old Testament. So, um, takes us to the next one. Matthew 5, 33, verse 37, or through 37? Yeah. 
Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, Take no oath at all, neither by heaven, nor, or for it is the throne of God, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool of, the, of his feet, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you take an oath by your head, for you cannot make a single hair white or black. But make sure your statement is yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond this is of evil origin. So the question being, well, are oaths bad? Can I not go to court and swear an oath? If I'm a witness, can I not swear an oath? If I'm, a, if I'm part of the jury, can I not swear an oath? Well, that really depends, that really depends on what kind of oath. Um, for instance, a secret oath. I vow that I, that I will that I will uh, that I will do this project. That's more of a secret oath versus a court oath where you're standing before a judge and you're saying, "Yes, I will do that. Um, I will, you know, sign those papers and I'll turn them in." Um, and it also depends what the purpose is of the oath. Um, Jesus here is talking more about people people taking oaths that are like secret, prideful oaths, and 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 kind of it, James talks about this too a bit. Um, kind of taking an oath with the wrong intent. And so Jesus isn't talking about no oaths at all. Obviously, you can go to court and you can be a juror and that kind of stuff. So, once again, the idea, a lot of people, sometimes people take things that Jesus said hyper-literal, where it has to be 100% literal. You can't, you, you can't take it any other way. It's like, who said that? And that's where a lot of the problems come from. Um... So then 542 says, Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Do I really have to lend to everyone? Well, once again, let's pay attention to the context Context here. No, you do not have to loan to everyone. First off, Paul says that if there's somebody who can work but simply refuses to work, they should not be provided for. So no. Also, um, we know that, that God doesn't want us to give people what will harm them. So there's another no. Um, so basically what we have here is ignoring the context, which is just foolish. If, if, if you back up here and read some of the other verses, and if anyone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. So in context, you see that he's not talking about, no, you don't have to literally loan to everybody who asks of you. You don't have to turn off your brain. Um, he, he's simply talking about not retaliating against enemies. This, I mean, I thought this was pretty clear, but some people take this kind of, like I said, to dark places. So um, in 543, it says, You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And the, and the, the problem being... Well, I don't like that. I don't like that God that God said that or that Jesus said that. And the truth is, that's not actually something that was in the Old Testament. It says here, um, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's not in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible did it say, hey, hey hate your enemy. So, no, God didn't say that, and Jesus didn't say that, and the Bible didn't say that. Um, he said, actually, if you paid attention to what he said, he said, you have heard that it was said to do this. Not that it was written. He said, you have heard that it was said. He never said, you have heard that it was written. It was never written in the, in the law. This is something that the, that the elders taught. You have heard that it, th this is what they're saying. He's criticizing the, this, the, 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 the tradition of the, of the Pharisees. And uh, this was actually one of their big problems. Is they said, hey, how come you guys, how come Jesus, how come you and your disciples don't follow the traditions? And Jesus is like, the traditions don't have any binding, binding effect. Um so he's more criticizing that. Um, not He's not criticizing the law's command. Jesus also might not be quoting them literally. So in other words, they, they might not have actually said the words, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but rather um, taught it. You know what I mean? Sometimes you can teach your kids something without actually saying it. You know what I mean? And I th he, he might he, that might be what Jesus is saying here. They don't actually say this, but you see how they're teaching you this. So I don't know for sure because I wasn't there, but, you know, just an idea. Um, so I might just be purposefully misquoting them to show their failure. Either way, God doesn't tell us to hate. This is how the elders were failing to teach the heart of the law. They were failing in the most basic idea of the law, to love your neighbor as yourself and to love God. Those, that was the heart of the law, and they, they completely failed at that. 
and uh, were instead, you know, basically teaching some nonsense that Jesus was not on board with. And then chapter 6, verse 6. But as for you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So I can't pray in public. I can't play at, pray at church. We can't open in prayer. When somebody asks me to pray for the communion, I can't pray for communion. Uh, like many things, this is another thing that is taken hyper-literal. It has to be, you know, taken it, it, in every single situation, in every single circumstance, it has to be mean this. And here's the thing. You can pray in public. You can pray in front of others. Jesus is teaching against showy prayers or praying for the sake of getting noticed. Like, you know, oh, look how good my prayer is. Oh, look at how... I can say these words, and oh, look at how spiritual I am. If Nicole was half as spiritual as me in my prayers. Another example would be, maybe if it was nowadays, Jesus would say, when you pray, don't go to great lengths to talk about your enemies in your prayer. Because a lot of Christians nowadays turn prayer into gossip. Let's talk about something. Let's talk about somebody I don't like. Uh, we need to pray for uh, Eli. You know, he's really a screw-up, having a lot of dirty thoughts. And I uh, don't want to, you know, I'm not gossiping or anything, just just, just telling you facts, you know. Uh, he's a bit of a pervert, and uh, I think he just really needs our prayer. See what I mean? It's just like, wow, you really used prayer, prayer time as a time for gossip, so thanks for that. And people do this all the time. Prayer chains are infamous for this. Like, they're just so many prayer chains that, I, that, I've, that I've known of through the years where people just, like, giving a whole, like, life story and all this, like, personal details and stuff. It's like, oh, hold on. This is a one-on-one -on -one conversation, not a gossip chain. Hold on. So um, Jesus is obviously not talking about uh, you, you. There's no excuse for praying in public. That's just that's just silly. Um, in fact, I remember one time in the Bible where King Solomon is praying in public for the people, and God answers them and fills the temple and it's just this whole big thing so don't lose sight of what god is saying because you don't see the whole sometimes what we do is we see, we see something like this oh don't pray in public so then we make it into a rule never in any circumstance pray when somebody else sees that you pray it's like hold, hold on it's like come on chapter 6 verse 13 <laughs> And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hold on. God can't tempt someone. How, how, why do we have to pray for God not to lead us into temptation if God doesn't tempt people? Well, here's the thing, and I want to say this in stages. Stage one, God does test our hearts. And sometimes he even brings by situations that test us. So maybe an unpleasant event, maybe a health concern, maybe um, a problem at work. Or maybe a promotion. It's not always bad things that he, that he tests our heart with. But he has ways of testing our heart. So that's step one, phase one. Okay, so phase two. We, in our heart of hearts, are led away into temptation by our own lust. The devil didn't make us do it. We really wanted to do it. Satan won't come along to tempt you with something that wasn't already in your heart. Let's say, for instance, Nicole, you're greedy. Okay, just roll with me on this, okay? You, I mean, you're just so overwhelmed with greed. You just gotta have it. It's all me, 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 mine. You know, so is Satan going to come by and say, hey, look at this really hot guy? You're not going to be tempted with that. You're tempted with the greed. Instead, he'll aim for your weakness. See what I mean? And it's the same thing when, when God's going to bring something by to test our hearts. He's going to do something that will actually test our hearts hearts so with that being said in our heart of hearts is this ugly temptation our own lust the own lust of our hearts is something that we desire we all have our own struggles we all have our own areas and you know those are the areas where we're going to lead ourselves astray with our with our lust so that takes us to the third thing so our our, our lust lead us away the third phase of this this prayer this is a prayer in in, in here do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is praying for God to be to guide us and to intervene in our day. Basically, God, as I go through the day, intervene in such a way where I'm not led away into the temptation. It's acknowledging the evil in your heart. It's acknowledging God's sovereignty. Um, and it's acknowledging your own weakness. So I hope that that was clear. There is no real difficulty in chapter 7 of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 7. So next week we will start on Matthew chapter 8. Any questions? 
No. How did you guys like the shorter format? I got it. I kept it under under twenty five minutes. It, it made it easier to uh -huh. remember and understand, and not have to worry about keep remembering more and more stuff. It didn't feel quite so overwhelming, did it? Yeah, right. Okay, that's what I was going for. Yeah. So, uh, any questions or comments? Everybody good? Okay.